Welcome! In this series of short videos, we will look at topics for the PowerBasic Windows Compiler. Today, we will look at adding limits to controls on your first form. This was our application at the end of our last video. We have a text box on screen and a couple of buttons with a label above the text box. Now, the subject of this video is how to limit what the user can do on your form. So why would you want to limit what the user can actually do with the form? Well, when you're designing client-facing applications, you'll probably spend a fair amount of your time making sure that the information the user enters in the form is actually valid. This may mean restricting the length of some fields or restricting what the user is allowed to do making some of the fields mandatory where they must fill them in, and making some fields optional. So we're going to add a couple of more objects onto our form. So let's go into the form designer. So here we have our form. We've got a box for the name. We're going to create one now for a telephone number. We can quite easily clone these objects we have on screen by selecting them, Pressing Ctrl C to copy and Ctrl V to paste. And this gives us an exact duplicate of what we've already got. If we just double click on this first one, we can change the caption and we will change the ID name of this label and we will do the same for the text box. Since this box is going to contain a telephone extension number, we'll make the box a little smaller. And we'll move all of this up to the side. Another common thing in a form is to make the user select from a list so that they can select only one thing from the list. So we'll find in our toolbox there is a combo box. If we double click on that, it will give us a combo box, which we will move over here. And we'll put a label in this one. And we'll call this department. And the combo box itself, if we have a look at this, we'll see on our combo box there's a caption on it which we can discard. And let's have a look at the styles on our combo box. Now there are three options on the combo box. It's defaulted to the standard drop down, which is a combination of a text box and drop down list box controls. This means the user can actually pick something from the list or they can actually type in a value that's not on the list to be selected. However, for this one, we're going to pick the first option, which is the drop down list, combination of label and drop down list box controls. This option will allow the user to pick from the list and only pick one item from the list. And we're going to limit the user to picking from the list and not keying anything in that's not on the list. So if we hit apply on this one, that's it done. Now we haven't told the form what to put on the list yet. We'll do that in the event handler. And we'll just name that combo box while we're in. Right, if we save that and go back to our code now, we'll see that in our form dialog, we now have some new objects. We have the combo box we just put in, and there's our label for the department, and there's our text box for the telephone extension. So if we try running our code, we'll see that we now have three objects on the screen. One for the name, one for the telephone extension, and a drop down, which admittedly has nothing in it at the moment, for the department. Now, since these are standard text boxes, there's no limit to what you can actually put in them. It would accept very many characters. Now there are two things we want to do here for these first two text boxes. The telephone extension I want to limit so that it only accepts numbers. I also want to limit it so it can take no more than four characters. And for the name, I want to limit that so it can take 
a name up to 100 characters in length. So how would we actually impose this limit on the user's form? If we have a look at the event handler, this is something we can set up when the form is initialized. Now I'm going to load in another library here because it has the code in it I want to use. If we hit the open button and we go into our libraries folder, we'll see there was a file called macros.encode. If we bring that one up, it appears in a separate tab. Now the macro I'm interested in is this one here. Now this is a very simple macro and all the macro does is at compilation time it will take this line of code I've highlighted and paste it in to your code. All it's doing is sending a message to the form for the object we have referenced and setting a limit on the length of the text. However, to save actually putting this line of code in every time we need to do it, we can call the macro itself with its two parameters. So if we go back to our event handler and just paste that line in, we know that we need to do this on two objects. So we're going to put it in twice and we know we want to limit the telephone extension object. So we'll put that one in first and we know we wanted to limit that to four characters. The second one we wanted to limit was the name. So if we paste that in and we wanted to limit the name to 100 characters. In order to make use of these macros, we have to put an include command in at the beginning of our first form.bas to reference the macros. So let's go up to the top of our code. As you'll remember from the last video, everything between the PB forms begin includes and the PB forms end includes is controlled by the forms designer. So we want to put our include command after that block. Macros.include is a file we wish to include. However, it's not in the same folder as our application. It's in a nested folder. So we can do a relative path on that one. Two dots, a slash, the name of the folder that contains our library, and another slash. That will include our macros. So if we try running our application now, we'll see it comes up on screen quite happily. If we go to the telephone extension, it will only take four characters. However, it's allowing the user to key in letters as well as numbers. And we want them only to key numbers. So we'll come back on that one. We also can see that in our username, it will only take 100 characters. So we've imposed our first limit on these two boxes. So how do we limit this text box to only accept numbers? Now well, let's go back to our forms designer again. If we double click on the text box and have a look at the styles, one of the options we can have in here down at the bottom is yes number. If that is ticked, then only numeric keys between 0 and 9 are allowed. So if we OK that, save our form again, and run our code, we will find in here, if the user tries to type any character that isn't a number, this little pop-up will appear. And only allow them to key numbers. And as we've limited it to four characters, they can only key four numbers. Any attempt to key anything else will bring up this little error message. So we've now limited this one to four characters and only numbers. So how do we handle the department? How do we populate this dropdown? If we look again at our event handler where we set up the limits on the first two, what we want to do now is we want to populate that department combo box. While well, you can put a great deal of code into your event handler, it's probably tidier to call a function to perform the population of a particular object. That way the callback function remains quite small and the 
function which is used to populate the object can be used in other places in your code. So let's create a new function to populate the department. So if you're going to populate an object on a screen, the function will need to know two things. It will need to know the handle of the dialog, the form, on which the control sits, and it will need to know the handle of the control itself. So two parameters. The CV handle is the standard way of actually referencing the form. And we knew earlier when we created our department that it had a handle as well. So we will pass these two values into this new function. So let's create the new function. So we'll set two variables up to be passed into this function. The dialog handle is a double word. And the handle for our object, which will be a combo, is a long. Combo boxes are quite common on forms. You will probably have forms with several combo boxes on them. So you'll be doing a lot of population of combo boxes, so it's sensible to have some common function to perform that. And we have another library which has that information in it quite nicely. If we go back to our libraries and have a look down, we have our PB Windows controls library which has a few useful functions in it. If we hit our F2 button to see what they are, we'll see that there's a populate combo function. So this populate combo function performs the population of a combo box. So let's copy the details of that into our new function. So we have the H dialog already defined as it's coming in here. And we already have the combo box. And there are two other parameters. The first one being an array and the second one being a selection. Now the idea behind these last two is the array will contain the information that's going to go into the combo box. The selection variable gives you a way of actually pre-selecting one of the items on the list. If you don't pre-select an item, the list will be unselected and the user will be forced to select something on the list. So let's prepare these two variables so they're referenced. We'll have the selection as a string and we'll have the array on a dim. Now we want to put data into the array for our department names. So let's create them in here. So we're going to use the array sign command to populate this array here with three items. Payroll, IT and distribution being our three departments. And we've also dimensioned the array to have three elements between element one and element three. Now since we're using yet another library, at the beginning of our code, we have also included the PB Windows Controls library at the beginning. So if we try running the code now, we'll see that we have a department combo box which is now populated with distribution, IT and payroll. Now, if for example we wanted to force the default value of a department to be distribution, we could quite happily change our code in the initialization section to have in here the value we wanted to put in. So let's put in distribution. And this is adding on a fourth parameter to the populate department function. So we'll pass this in as a selection. And that means we don't need this line of code anymore. And this will mean that since distribution is going in as the third parameter, it will attempt to pre-select that on the list. So if we run the code now, we'll see that distribution is indeed pre-selected. The user, of course, can change it to any of the other ones. But there is no way of unselecting this one now. So we now have limited the name field to be 100 characters. We have limited the telephone extension to be only numbers, but only four of them. And we have limited the user to which departments they can actually pick. The other thing we'll want to do with this particular form is to ensure when the form loads initially that the first field is pre-selected. At the moment, 
none of the fields are selected and when we tab down it it goes down to the button and then our field then the extension then the department then the exit button and then the do it button so let's change the tab order we go back into our forms designer at the top of our dialog on the toolbar there is a tab order editor if we click on that we can select by clicking on them the order that our tab is going to be in so we'll click on the name field first the telephone extension second the comma box third the do it button fourth and the exit button fifth and once we've closed that and saved it and if we run our code now we'll see the focus is now sitting in the name field and if we press the tab button it will go to the extension then the department then the do it button and then the exit button and then back to the name again so we've now put some limits on what the user can actually do with this form so when we click the do it button at the moment it pulls back the value in the name field let's pull back the value in the other two fields as well so if we go back to our event handler and have a look inside there we'll see if we scroll down when the OK button is actually pressed at the moment we're doing a control get on the text name field to the name now we want to do something very similar to pull the information back from the telephone one we want the handle for the telephone and we'll need a variable to put it into and we'll just call that extension and we'll declare that up at the top of a code and while we're here we'll create a new one for the department so we now have two new variables one for extension and one for department now to save a little bit of typing one thing you can do quite happily is to use the prefix command what the prefix command is going to do is it will take this piece of text and add it to the beginning of each line in the prefix block at compilation time just saves you a wee bit typing and makes the code look a wee bit tidier so the other thing we want to do is to pull back the value in our combo box as this particular combo box is only a drop down we can use exactly the same command to pull the information out of it as the user can only select one thing it's a simple get text command so we take our combo box and we'll put that in as well so we'll put the combo box handle in and we'll pull the value back to the department variable and we can quite easily add all this information into our message box by putting the variable name then a carriage return line feed and then the next variable name and the final one so if we run our code now and hit the do it button we will see all three pieces of information are pulled back quite happily even when you change department the value will be pulled back so we've now added a couple of extra objects onto our form and we've proved we can limit what the user can actually do with them and we can pull the information back quite easily if in your form any of the fields are mandatory say for example they must put a telephone extension in you can always test it when the button is clicked to see whether the field is populated or not in other words does the variable have anything in it if it does not have anything in it then you can bring a message box up to the user to let them know that they've missed some vital piece of information and they have to key it in before you let them proceed on to the next form or the next part of your application but that's it for today thank you for watching